All right, let's get started. Um, so, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Communication and Signal Processing Seminar. Uh, today, I'm delighted. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the research areas for supporting the uh, seminar. It was NCIS and SP. And uh, I also wanted to thank Kate Goodwin for helping organize this. She's the um, person behind the scenes making everything uh, click. <clears throat> So uh, our speaker today is Natasha Devoy. Natasha is a professor in the uh, ECE department at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where she has been since January 2009. Before that, from July 2007 to 2008, she was a lecturer at Harvard University, where she also obtained a PhD um, in 2007. And before, uh, before coming to Harvard, she, was, uh, she got her honors in, uh, B in electrical engineering from McGill University. She's a recipient of the NSF Career Award in 2011 and was named UIC's Researcher of the Year in the Rising Star category in 2012. She has done uh, several associate editor duties in transaction wireless communication, uh, JSAC, particularly JSAC, transactions and uh, cognitive communications and networking, and the transactions and information theory. She co -chair chaired the uh, Women in Information Theory Society from 2015 to 2018. And she's currently an information theory distinguished lecturer. Um, theory and applications to hardware security, cognitive radio, software defined radio, radar, relay, zero error, and two way communication networks. And so she's going to tell us about uh, interactive communications today. Natasha, the floor is all yours. <clears throat> okay. For the chat, so you, if any questions come up, I'll interrupt you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do uh, very much um, hope this is an interactive seminar in some sense. So please feel free to uh, just shout out, right? Unmute yourself and shout out, stop me. Uh, it's not such a long or technical talk today. Um, and I am giving it standing up to simulate the true lecture experience. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna be sharing my iPad and I'll write a little bit on it. Okay, just to like make this a little bit more interactive. So this is me. So I'm going to be talking to you about interactive communication and when does adaptation work and why. So since I've given this talk a few times, I like to start off by just locating where I'm from uh, or my institution, UIC, because sometimes people confuse it with neighboring institutions. And I just wanted to set the record straight. So UIC is located here. I don't know if who has been to Chicago, but this map might be familiar to some of you who have been here. And you'll sort of, um, I don't know, some of the big things are that there's a bean sitting here in Millennium Park. Then we have this, the Sears Towers around here. Uh, we have the, or Willis Tower, I suppose it's called now. We have the Hancock Tower sitting around here. And so you can see that UIC is sort of close to downtown uh, Chicago, um, about a mile west of downtown, of the loop, I guess. Uh, we are the sister school of UIUC, who is two and a half hours southwest of Chicago. We are, um, I, the University of Chicago is, you know, about half an hour that way, and Northwestern is about half an hour that way. Uh, so, you know, we're in the midst of a whole bunch of other exciting places, um, but that's where UIC is. Okay, uh, I come from a communications and information theory background, so this whole talk is going to be about um, two-way communications and interactive communications. So I, I view information theory at being good at understanding one way or non-adaptive communication and data compression. Indeed, I think this is the way Shannon initially envisioned it. Even though he wrote some of the seminal papers on two-way communications, his original 1948 paper was definitely a one-way paper. Um, traditionally, information theory looks at uh, asymptotic in N, the number of channel uses measures, such as capacity, error exponents, and rate distortion theory. Uh, recently, there's been a flurry of interest in non-asymptotic and finite block length bounds, um, but that is actually not what I'm going to be talking about today. So what I want to talk about is interactive communications, and to do that, let's talk first about what I mean by non-interactive and what I mean by interactive. So one way or non-interactive definitions are According to our base, follow this diagram that many of you have seen um, in uh, communications courses, right? We define a channel code, an MN channel code, 
for a channel with input alphabet calligraphic X, transition probability PY given X and output alphabet Y consists of the messages, an encoding function, and a decoding function. What makes it non-interactive is the fact that this encoding function is a function only of the messages. Okay. So this is the straightforward one-way channel communication. The decoding function is now a function only of, of course, the channel output YN and estimates what message was sent. So a rate is called achievable if there exists a sequence of such codes whose probability of error goes to zero as the number of channel uses tends to infinity and the capacity of this channel is the supremum over all achievable rates. So this is the plain vanilla one-way channel capacity definition. Uh, we know Shannon showed that the uh, information channel capacity of this channel is given by the maximum overall input distributions P of X of the mutual information between X and Y. And this corresponds to, it has an operational meaning corresponding to the highest rate in bits per channel use that you can communicate at reliably. The channel coding theorem then says that the information capacity is equal to the operational capacity. So, you know, the solution to this optimization problem of finding the highest rate that you can communicate at reliably, meaning probability of error vanishes asymptotically, is given by this magical formula. Okay. But in reality, communication is often interactive, right? We rarely have a one-way conversation, and I hope this whole talk is not a one-way conversation. Can you guys actually hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so, um, so communication generally is two ways. And, you know, in, in all practical systems, there are acts and NACs being sent all the time. Most, you know, unless you're just downloading um, a movie off Netflix, perhaps that's a one-way thing, but, you know, sometimes you want to send your own information and tell them what movie you want to watch, right? So most in communication is interactive. So the first, um, uh, generalization of one-way communication to communication with feedback is often called the channel with perfect feedback, perfect output feedback. And here we notice this, the presence of this perfect channel here, right? All right. So there's a link that links the output of the, the channel to the encoder. And now this encoder can be a function, not only of the message W, but also of the perfect feedback. So we can redo these definitions of what is a channel code for this channel with perfect feedback. And you know, most of the things stay the same. The big thing that changes is that the encoding function now is not only a message of a uh, function of the messages, but also of the past received outputs. So the message at time i is determined by this encoding function f of i, which can use all of the past outputs from time one to i minus one. So that's the major uh, generalization here. Again, uh, things are, a rate is called achievable if there exists a sequence of codes, all the same definitions. And for here, we have considered only a block code. So here, you know, um, we're not allowing for variable length code, so I don't have to talk about stopping times yet. Okay. So for channels with feedback, there are many results known. Uh, one of them is that feedback does not increase the capacity of memoryless channels. So memoryless channels are channels for which the output at time i only depends on the input at time i and no previous inputs or outputs. So here, uh, capacity, viewing capacity as a metric of how to evaluate this channel is a little bit limited in some sense because the capacity is not increased when you use feedback. Naturally, everything that you um, do with feedback could mimic things that you can do without feedback. So capacity should be no smaller than without feedback, but in fact, it's no larger either in this case. However, feedback is not useless because feedback, or at least perfect feedback, can dramatically affect the error exponent. The error exponent is the exponent, the exponential rate of decay of the probability of error. So here's the probability of error in your system. The error exponent is this function here, which shows you how fast this probability of error decays in block length n as n goes to infinity. And this er, is, it's an error exponent. It's a function of the rate at which you're transmitting. With, you know, in general, the larger the rate, 
the slower your error exponent and the smaller your rate, the further you backed off from capacity, the quicker you can get that um, error exponent to decay. Okay, so here, so if you care about, and, and in reality, you know, we're always transmitting with finite n um, about error exponents and about getting your probability of error small, feedback can really help. So capacity suggests it can't help, error exponents, a little bit more of a refined metric suggests that it can. It can also dramatically shorten the block lengths that are needed to achieve a given error at a given rate. So this is, um, you know, uh, Polyansky's work. Polyansky's work on uh, feedback at finite block lengths. And you know, what remains unknown? Well, there remain many, many things unknown. And uh, my, my PhD student, Kenneth Palacio Baus and I, uh, we wrote a, a recent paper about error exponents for one and two way AWGN channels, where I think one of the big open problems for one way channels with feedback is dealing with noisy feedback. So when the feedback link here is a noisy link. And so here, this noise is causing a lot of problems and there's uh, much, much less is known in this setting. And that's the setting we tackle in this paper. And we look at zero rate um, zero rate achievable error exponents for one way and two way channels. So I've given, uh, as, a, as a distinguished lecturer, I've been this for the past two years, I've given a whole bunch of these um, talks where at this point I would usually start talking about this paper or one way channels with feedback. And I thought, um, since it's almost the end of my tenure as distinguished lecturer, that I wanted to talk about more about an area that I find interesting, that is not just my own work. Uh, an area that I find, or a topic that I find um, not many people are working on, and that I think has the potential to, uh, that has some very interesting theoretical questions. And that is the two-way channel. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna not, <laughs> I apologize if you have all read this paper and <laughs> we're expecting a talk on that. I'm gonna talk about something I find interesting and I think I'm hoping some of you might have the tools to solve and can help me solve. I'm actually going to be presenting a, a, an open problem and a conjecture I have as to its solution. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different talk for me. And I hope you'll um, enjoy it and just listen along and see if you can think about ways to solve this problem. So here's the channel setup. So it's a two-way channel. And Shannon actually defined two-way channels uh, you know, a few years after his original paper. And in this setup, you, we have two sources now, right? Wanting to transmit independent messages. So here's message one and the destination. Uh, so I guess I should call this encoder one, terminal two. So terminal one has message one, terminal two has another message, message two, and they want to exchange mess messages. And this is done over a channel in which the inputs can, can completely mix in general. So the two inputs can affect both outputs. And this is the most general channel model you can think of. And you can see that the inputs at each time i now naturally depend on the messages uh, each terminal has and all of the past received outputs that that terminal sees. Okay. So two-way channels have been considered, Shannon considered them. And what so, I find so interesting yeah, that's yeah, a quick question there. I mean, uh, this still does not capture interactive communication, right? I mean, it's like each source wants to send a message across to the other side. It's not like there there is a joint conversation necessarily. There, the messages are not changing over time. Yeah. So I, I understand what you mean. So there is a framework in which the messages are actually changing over time. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or that yeah. they 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 arrive at some joint joint thing which they don't know they they sort of discuss and then they find out but there's something interesting together that they need to explore it's correct yeah. it's not that it's not that they still have it's still the plain vanilla um communication setup like there are two messages that just need to be exchanged the interactive part is i mean okay this is my terminology i suppose but some other people have used is that the the the, the channel inputs can can change. It's, it's basically how feedback is interactive. I, I would call feedback interactive in some sense because it's 
the channel inputs are changing with the channel outputs. Thanks. Yeah. Sure, sure. But at this point, I think it's just terminology. But yeah, I think your problem is much too difficult to consider. Okay, so the so what do we know about two-way channels? So uh, capacity in general is unknown. Okay, so this is already a huge thing. And I'll show you one uh, particularly um, awful channel, I mean, a channel that is remarkably sim simple for which we still don't know the channel capacity and which is embarrassing, I think, for the information theoretic community. Okay, and so uh, whenever capacity is known for two-way channels, it's in a setting in which interaction is useless, meaning in which the two-way channel decomposes into two one-way channels. So two one-way channels, just at operating in parallel, or it becomes a channel in which basically you have to do time sharing. And these pictures at the bottom sort of tell you what's going on there. In this other, in the channel on the right here, you can only send one at a time, okay? So there's no real two-way nest to that channel. You see what I mean? Like one is sending, the other one is holding their input fixed or something so that the other one can have a larger channel and vice versa. But whenever, so this is sort of the classes of channels for which two-way channel capacity is known. So why is it so hard? So here is the uh, example that I find um, fascinating and uh, at the same time awful that we don't know the capacity of. So it's the binary multiplier channel. So it's a binary input, binary output channel, and it's in fact, it's a deterministic channel. All right, it's, it's not even a random channel. So if you input, here's my input at channel at uh, side one, here's my input at side two, and this is what the channel does. So the channel just takes the and of two binary inputs. Okay. So exactly, this is the this is the channel, right? So capacity or equal rate capacity, even picture everything about this channel is symmetric. So let's just consider trying to find the equal rate capacity point, like when R one is equal to R two, right? So it, that should be an equal. Um, they should have the same maximum rate that they can achieve, and this should lie somewhere between 0.5 bits per channel use and one bit per channel use. Right, because a binary channel can never transmit more than one bit per channel use. And we can achieve 0.5 by doing time sharing. So here at the bottom, I just show you a slew of results that exist for this channel. And you can see that the capacity is sort of sandwiched in between these numbers. All right, so you say, ah, oh, but you're being so picky. You want the third digit. Yeah, we want the third digit, OK? This is an annoying thing because uh, it's such a simple channel. It's a deterministic channel. We still don't know its capacity. And this points to the fact that we don't know how to properly adapt our signals to past received outputs. We don't know how to do this compression properly. OK. Natasha, and what, uh, I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, when you say we don't know the capacity, do you mean we don't know it in, uh, in single letter form? because there are results, for instance, in Mac with feedback. And so when Y1 and Y2 are the same Y, like common, common output in this channel, where this, uh, this problem seems very, very similar to the, to the Mac with feedback. And there we know multi-letter expressions through directed information and so on. So do we not have this kind of expressions here? We do, and I will okay. show them. We do have multi-letter expressions with directed information. Okay, good. That, that's coming up in a few slides. But you know, I so when you can't compute the thing, so one solution would be to be able to compute those things. Okay. So can you in the Mac channel with feedback compute those things? No. Oh. No. no. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So I guess it depends on what you I, I want the number. <laughs> so, Got it. Yes. Okay? Thank you. So I don't care if it's a single letter expression or not. I want the number. So, but that's just me, okay? This is just what I think this channel needs. Okay, so let's just look at, um, so that's, that's where we're going. And the rest of this talk is just me talking about what is known about this channel and what my conjecture is for that capacity and how I think it should be, or what, what some tools are that point at this being the capacity, okay? So 
here is my two-way uh, adaptive def definitions. So here again, it's the same. It's a two-way code where you know the only new stuff here is that we have two encoders, of course, one at each side, and they are each making use of both their own message and then their own feedback. Okay, and so now we also have two decoders. So we're we're designing more encoders and more decoders, but but essentially they're the same uh, definitions. Okay. So uh, we, now we talk about rate pairs because we have two rates, two messages, and uh, we call these achievable if the same kind of uh, normal definitions, All right? And so what we're looking for is regions of these sort of forms. It, for my binary multiplier channel, you know, they should always be within this region, right? Anything that I find should be below this or inside this square, right? But hopefully it's larger than this, and in fact, this is the scenario for the BMC. We have some inner bounds, we have some outer bounds, but we don't have anything matching yet. Okay, so that's where we're at. So uh, Shannon has general inner and outer bounds for the two-way channel. So this is two-way channel. So this is not binary multiplier channel. This does not require a determinism. This is, this is just fully general P, Y1, Y2, given X1, X2. Just because I've been switching back between binary multiplier and not. Here, this is fully general. And so you can see the inner bound and the outer bound sort of makes sense if you look at them, right? The, the rate in direction one is less than the mutual information between uh, the trend input one, the output at the other user, given your own message, uh, given their own message, because that transmitter knows what it sent, right? So if that somehow alters this distribution, you can sort of consider that known. And so this. These ones, these bounds make sense. The inner and the outer bound have the same form, but they're over different sets of joint distributions on the input alphabet, px1, x2. So the inner bound is over all uh, product distributions, and the outer bound is over all joint distributions. And notice that in an outer bound, you cannot, in general, because x1 and x2, or sorry, terminal 1 and terminal 2 are operating independently, right? They cannot, in general, make this joint distribution. So that is why the, the lower one is, in fact, an outer bound. Okay? But one would imagine that over time, as, these, as transmission takes place, there can be some correlation between uh, x1 and x2 that they can build up. Right? They can build up some kind of common knowledge. So one would imagine that there should be something in between these two, this inner and this outer bound. And that is, in fact, true. There's a tighter outer bound that you can create for the two-way cha channel, and it's called a dependence balance bound. And this is uh, me just cutting and pasting from uh, Zheng's paper, Zheng's 1986 paper, that basically says, OK, if you look at these rates, they look quite like Shannon's, except we've introduced this new auxiliary random variable Z1, Z2, that is meant to sort of capture some of the dependence that is built up while you communicate over this channel. Okay, and I can uh, we can talk about this later, but this is provides a tighter outer bound, okay, because it sort of takes care of not a fully joint distribution in the outer bound. All right. So again, as I said before, in two-way channels, whenever we are able to compute the capacity, um, the, the number of the capacity, uh, it turns out to be either equal to two parallel channels or timeshare channels. All right, so for example, uh, this is an example of when it becomes two uh, parallel channels. Let's see if I had a nicer build here. So here is our, uh, just consider this channel. Again, this is a deterministic channel, right? So the inputs and outputs are zero ones and the output is just the XOR of the inputs. So this is a remarkably simple channel. We're just warming up, right? So at each channel use, the receiver can take the XOR of the inputs, and just, you know, because it knows what it transmitted, it trans it just XORs its own input signal, and then you receive the other one perfectly. So clearly you see that you can achieve this distribution, or uh, sorry, this rate region. Okay. So the capacity of this two-way channel is one bit per channel use per user. You don't even need to do an outer bound. This is the maximum possible. OK, so here, adaptation is not helpful. Why do I say this? Because I don't need to do 
uh, for this particular channel, I don't need to do any coding. I can ignore the feedback altogether in my encoding scheme and still achieve capacity. So that's why I'm saying adaptation or interaction is not useful. Here is Shannon's push to talk channel. It's, he called it a push to talk channel. And here, if you, the input output um, uh, relationship is not as easy to see, but if you do stare at it long enough, you will realize that communication in the forward direction is only possible if you set x2 to zero. So that means only using this line, this line, and this line. And if x1 uses one or two, so basically this line, this one, or this one. And here you can see because of the presence of these zeros, or you can believe me that this is, for this particular channel, the capacity region is gonna be given by this um, time sharing looking region. So basically it says one of the users has to hold their bit fixed and the other user uses whatever they want and then the vice versa. And then you'll be able to get anywhere between these two bits by uh, adjusting how much you hold X2 fixed versus how much you hold X1 fixed. Okay, so here again, adaptation is not useful. Why? Because again, your encoding scheme here does not make use of any of the feedback that you're seeing or any of the channel outputs that you're seeing in order to encode in, in creating your next channel inputs. Okay. Here is another channel that is getting a little bit more practically relevant. It's the two-way Gaussian channel. So here we, we model the channel as two users send at the same time. And what they receive is some linear combination of the two symbols plus noise. And these combinations can be different and the noise can be different. Okay. So here, uh, what each user could do, and this is something that many people doing full duplex might <laughs> take issue with is that you know at, at receiver one, since you know what you transmitted information, theoretically, you should be able to just cancel that out, right? At, at terminal one, you scratch signal one. And so what you receive, what you see then, the result is two parallel looking channels, right? You have one direction, you have y2 is equal to cx1 plus n1, and the other one is just a one-way looking channel. And so this, this two-way channel seems to decompose into these two one-way channels because of the fact that we have this additive structure in the channel and you can remove your own impact on the outputs. Okay. And so here, in fact, Han showed that the capacity of this channel is just the two one-way capacities. Okay. And here again, adaptation is useless. So here I can show and this is where I was going to check to see if I had the time and whether you guys wanted to see it. Uh, we can show, I was going to do the, the converse to show why, you know, oy, sorry, why taking R1, that's an equal to mutual information between X1, Y2 given X2, why maximizing these things over PX1, X2 joint such that expected value of x1 squared, p1. So power constraints, because we have a Gaussian channel, results in capacity r1 half log 1 plus uh, p1 over sigma squared, and this. But if you believe this, I think I will skip it given time. I'd rather talk a little bit more about the other stuff. So but the, the, the point is, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this would work if these, uh, the noise, noise are independent, right? N1 and N2 are independent. This works if N1 and N2 are independent, yes. If they are if dependent. They are not, then if they're dependent, then you would need interaction and you would, I mean, not, I don't know the answer. I'm just saying that would change the problem dramatically. It would, it would. I agree. I have not thought about that, but I yes, it would. Because then the, that's useful to know. Because then you have a feedback about what your you know what your receiver saw in terms of noise, right? Yeah. But yes, that's a that's a nice extension. I don't know if that's been done actually. Hmm. But that's okay. So 
just making sure is this uh, the joint px1 comma x2 or the marginals joint okay joint yeah and this is shown by han in 84 and you can do it and it just it depends on jensen's inequality and the maximum differential entropy is gaussian basically it's not a hard proof but uh i think what if n1 and 2 are uh, not independent right or yeah, yeah. iid right perhaps with memory or perhaps yeah both ways would be tricky yeah, I guess. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. maybe it's been studied i don't know but it's interesting i wonder if that's a practically relevant um relevant for some channels because in that case it might be worth doing right cool i thought i was going to be the only one making open <laughs> open questions Okay, so here is what this is a summary sort of of what um, people uh, know about uh, capacity of two way channels parallel two way channels parallel two way channels are ones for which P y one y two uh, given x one x two decompose as P y one given x two times P y two given x one. So the channel naturally becomes uh, a parallel channel it's Okay, uh, which would your VJ constraint would violate that. Uh, the binary module two added channel, we showed that one. Two way restricted channel, we kind of, these are all sort of variations from Shannon. The two way Gaussian noise channel, that one just becomes two one way channels. And then there are some generaliz generalizations of all these kind of results. People have tried to find the most general classes of channels for which this sort of breaking up of the two channels works okay and there are two-way exponential families of channels channels with a whole bunch of symmetry properties and this is really i think what is this the, the state of the art here uh which was quite recent right two years ago okay so all of these channels capacity is known when adaptation is useless meaning when you just ignore the feedback and that's not very interesting like i'd like to know when feedback is useful and how to use it really right in a two-way setting when capacity is known, unknown is general discrete memoryless channels. And the one I'm going to look at is the binary multiplier channel. OK, so an open problem here, if you're looking for one, is non-trivial and computable example of the capacity of a two-way channel uh, when adaptation is useful, I should write. OK, so uh, this is a little bit of what I was going to talk about. You know, I've worked on error exponents for two-way channels, but I don't want to talk about that. I only want to talk about this DMC, really. And at the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, how it might um, relate to some other fields that you all know more about than me, I think. But I would love to know more. So why is this really so difficult? So it, the problem is really that the, the space over which to code is enormous. To me, that's the problem. And the fact that you have in some way, noisy output. Right? So, you know, the space over which to code is enormous. We have this, um, you know, at each user, so at user one and at user two. So for each message W1, for each W2, you have to create a function F1 of W1, which gives you channel input one. You have to create F2, which is W1 and Y1. Create X at time two, X1 at time one, X1 at time two, F3, Y1, Y1 at time one, Y1 at time two, X1, three, et cetera. And depending on the size of these, oh, that all disappeared. Depending on the size of those things, it can really get big. Okay, so we can perhaps express this nicely, as in the next slide, but it is in general not easy to solve. So here is um, Kramer's multi-letter capacity region, which I think what uh, was referred to earlier. And so here you can express the capacity region of all single output or common output. So here is the common output two-way channels using this following multi-letter expression, where here this L is the, the length. So the number of channel uses, and you're going to let this L go to infinity. And so here we have what's called a directed information, which is uh, a variant of the mutual information, which is more 
uh, suitable for when you have uh, feedback and for when you have this um, causal structure in the distributions over which you are taking these mutual informations. Uh, and then, you know, so we're taking the union of all rate tuples satisfying these two inequalities for all L and over all distributions that factor as below. This is simply an enormous space. And while we have an expression, I think unless we have a tool to compute this thing, it to me is still an unsolved problem. Right? And so here is a directed information, but I, I don't really want to talk to that. I, I want to just emphasize that, yeah, we have an expression. And if we can optimize this, I don't know. Do you think we can use machine learning to optimize this thing? Right? Does anybody know optimization theory that can be used to solve this? And we can reduce the, the, the channel all the way down to the binary multiplier channel. And you know, I think it could be done perhaps, but so the open problem here I have for everyone is to evaluate such region or approximate them numerically, ideally with some kind of you know finite gap capacity, perhaps um, bounds. I think that's a really interesting one, which you know, I think maybe information theorists are not the best equipped to solve, right? Maybe we need optimization and um, control, or I don't know what. So the real question is uh, to try to find a non-trivial and computable example of the capacity of a two-way channel when interaction is useful, when interaction, okay? And that's really, really still missing any single example of when we know the capacity and interaction is useful. So I think the one to look at is the, the binary multiplier channel because it's the, only binary, it's the only binary input, binary output channel for which the capacity is not known. All the other ones either map onto this one or are equivalent to one of the other settings, the, this one or this one, okay? So this is the only one that we don't know. So here are again, the upper and lower bounds differing only in the third digit, okay? So it is like we have, you know, narrowed down the scope somewhat, but it's, we're still not there. So what is the benchmark against which we should compare any achievable scheme? So we're now we're starting to think about the binary multiplier channel alone. The first thing we can do is of course, one user sends at a time, right? So if one user sends a one, right? So if I say I'm X one and I only send ones, then, you know the output is equal to, sorry, the output is equal to x2, right? And if x2 only sends a one, then the, then the other one. So you can just vary the amount of time each does send, holds their input fixed and sends no information for that direction and get this, this line, right? Okay, so we should at least be able to, if we're looking at the equal rate point, which is, oops, 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 we should at least be able to do better than r1 is equal to r2 is equal to 0.5 bits per channel use, right? We should be able to do better than that. And we can, okay. So what is the, I wanted to show you this really beautiful scheme called the Hagelbarger code that is so genius. And uh, maybe you have already thought about it in your head. So the step one here is to just take your string of n bits that you wanna transmit and just send them directly, okay? So here, what is, why did I highlight some in green? I highlighted in green the ones where the output is one. Okay. If the output of this channel is one, then I know that both inputs must have been one. Okay, so for those outputs, I know there's perfect communication happening in the other direction. And you know, the one was transmitted. The problem is in this binary multiplier channel, when you have this zeros, right? It's this zero, 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 one structure. So often, whenever one of the two users sends a zero, it completely destroys the transmission, right? So what do you do now? So what you do in the next channel use or the next sequence of channel uses is in the spots where the Y was zero. So you eliminate the spots where the ones happen because there I know exactly what was transmitted. In the spots where the Ys were zero, invert the original signal, okay? So if there was originally a zero, zero sent, it will now become a one, one, and you'll get a one. If there was originally a zero, one sent, it will become a one, zero, and it will stay zero and vice versa. But because though there will only be ones, you can see what's gonna happen that, you know, either you get a one and you know that zero, zero was sent, 
And in the other cases, you know, if you see a zero, that the other guy had the opposite of you. And you also resolve it. So in these two steps, this is a two-phase scheme, you can completely resolve this. You can completely, perfectly transmit these end bits. This to me is a beautiful scheme. It's somewhat surprising that it doesn't achieve capacity, that there are schemes that do better than this, right? The rate of this, if you do not optimize the input distributions of zero ones, would, can be calculated as 0.571. If you do want to optimize the, the rate of the, you would have NHP over N times, uh, I guess, P squared plus 2N times P1, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't remember what it is not right now, but you can optimize the input distributions of zeros and ones and get it to be a slightly higher, okay, 0 0.593. So in both cases, you're already doing better than time sharing with such a simple scheme and such a simple optimization. Okay, so if you just make it a little bit more likely to send a one than a zero, you can get a higher rate already. Okay, so that's the Hagelbarger. And this Hagelbarger, you'll notice, is actually an example of a variable length code. So depending on, so you can see here already that this is an adaptive scheme, right? Because it, it uses interaction. It uses the channel output to determine the next channel inputs, right? Because you, it, you eliminate the, the ones, right? The positions where it was a one. That means you're using inter interaction, okay? So to me, this is the simplest example of an interactive variable length code. Uh, I really, really like this one. And I'm hoping, actually, if anybody knows of an example in, in whatever, in electronics or in VLSI, whatever, that, that has this AND function being a natural component of it, this would be the, the like, no-brainer thing to apply to that. All right. So uh, Shannon's inner single letter inner and outer bounds for the BMC, if you just calculate those, those are here and here and those are still there's still quite a gap there so people have worked hard to kind of um, diminish that gap and the people that have worked the hardest have been uh, people at uh, TU Eindhoven uh, this is a series of um, PhD theses uh, working together with Franz Willems and um, uh, Schalkweg 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 of Kyle, Schalkweg and Kailas Okay, so they worked a lot about on these two way channels and they have the best known inner and outer um, results. And I, looking at this, you know, the cover of this in particular PhD thesis makes me think I really should have done something cool like that too, right? This is like, and this, we'll see, this actually really represents this two way channel in some sense. This is a some kind of fractal representation. Okay, so what their, their cool schemes and how they work is they try to to derive new rates by viewing this two-way communication over the binary multiplier channel as um, adaptive code trees, as variable length subdivisions of a square. Okay, so picture we wanna send message. This is the message of user one, and this is the message of user two. And you know we wanna send one of these and one of these, and we just pick the message independently. So we're gonna to wanna to transmit say this square, all right? So the name of the game now is to transmit the minimum number of channel uses so that we can identify that square, which square was the original one sent. So uh, the rate then of this, um, of any, any tree or any code tree, and a code tree here will be just what you should send at each channel use based on the previous channel uses. And we're gonna try to define that by looking at regions of this square. The rates can be calculated as follows, where this is just the total number of transmissions needed to transmit every pair once. And so then the number M1, M2 divided by M1 times M2, right? This is what's on the bottom and it just flipped up to the top is a, the average number or expected number because the, we have a uniform distribution on M1, M2. It's the expected number of transmissions, right? Expected number of transmissions. Okay, so this is generally a combinatorial problem at this point. There's not much stochastic stuff going on here anymore, um, except that, you know, uh, except the stochasticity in the message, right? And perhaps you use a, a, a stochastic uh, encoder. 
So uh, a generalization of Hagelbarger's code uh, was proposed uh, in Mayerson's thesis, um, or Blumen's thesis, the Schalkwerk, I think, was the original one. Uh, and you can alternate between these two types of divisions. They call them divisions, inner resolutions and outer resolutions. And this is called an inner resolution on the left, and this is called an outer resolution. And what it does is it says, well, if you if your message lies in this interval, send a one, and here you send a zero. And likewise here, if your message lies to the left of this alpha one, send a zero, and here send a one. And so here, what's written in these squares, this one is the output, right? So these are the outputs. Okay, so you can do that, right? You can just opt to try to optimize over this alpha and try to figure out, you know, what you should send. And then once you get here, so if you're here, then you're done, right? Then you know what was sent. You know both of the messages must have been in this square. And then you can you you redo a square. So you then loop back and do this again. If you now you received a zero, right? Then you're in this region. And then you proceed to what is called an outer bound resolution. Now you want to resolve in which kind of region you're operating here. And you switch. You do this kind of like we did with the Hago bar. You switch what you send. So if you're in here, you send a one. Here you send a zero. Here you send a one. Here you send a zero. Okay. And so here, then your outputs will be that. If you know it's a one one, then again your shape that you're now or the ambiguity of your thing is now in there. So this is square, and here you have these rectangles. And so again, you loop back to this I situation. And so you can see that you can sort of switch between these O's and the I's until your desired resolution is met by proper scaling of stuff. So that is sort of their, this idea of subdividing these squares and these outputs here are the series of outputs. So here you can see that if you do, the, do this thing four times, you can kind of see that you can sub subdivide the square into these types of shapes using this scheme. So for example, in division one, I would have here. So how do I see division one is here? I look at the first bit, the first output bit. So here they're all zeros. So here I'm sending a one, here send a zero, again, zero and one. And you see here, these ones get resolved, right? So here, since if I'm anywhere in this square, my first bit is a one, I get to do that again. And if anywhere in my first bit I got a zero, I have to do one of these outer bound divisions. So my division two then, here is my division one. Here is gonna be my division two. So if I was in here, here is my division two if I was there. And my division two if I was here is just like this, which is going to divide these second bits into this ones, zeros, I don't know if you can see what I mean here. That's here. The second bit is repeating that I and O division. And you can sort of do this again and again. You see, like here would be, so here's, oh, now I, I messed up the colors. So let's we do division one in red. And we can do division two in blue. So here, if you're in here, you're doing that. And if you're in here, you're doing that. Let's do, do division three in green. So here I see that it's gonna be that. Here we have a rectangle again, so we're gonna do that. Here we have, see what I mean? And here, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're doing this. We're doing this rectangle, the I division, and so on. So you can keep going, right, to get the final one. How do you then get a rate, you have to sort of look at what fraction of the time you're in these different divisions. Um, Schalkrack's 1982 inner bound slightly um, improves this and they add this M division, which I, I think because of the lack of time, I'm just gonna skip that. But there are many kind of fancier ways to do these divisions and you get these fractal looking things, okay? Um, there are some ways, to, tricks to improve the strategies, but I find these tricks, while they achieve very close to capacity, they're somehow, they're not very simple. And they have, I don't know, they're not elegant. To me, it just doesn't feel like the capacity should be like this. It should, 
feel a little bit simpler. If you actually read these theses, they're really quite quite involved to, to get these, these strategies right. And they have looked a little bit at brute force um, enumeration of strategies up to a certain depth, but at that point they didn't have enough computing power. So it might be worth like looking if we could if we could use ML to kind of speed up the, the actual brute force search or combinatorial search, perhaps with a little bit of smarts to, to guide it in a better way. But you know, you get these things that look a little bit like this. They're these fractal inspired methods, which they can actually show things about and calculate um, better rates. So this is sort of like the be best rate you can get to using their methods. Okay, so the connections I wanted to talk about, this is where I am not um, the best person to talk about this, but I realized that there's been a whole bunch of work about um, active hypothesis testing and dynamic program formulations for channels with feedback. The question to me is whether this is um, applicable to deterministic channels like the BMC. Uh, in particular, it's not like a feedback channel with perfect output feedback. There is perfect output feedback, but it is this mixture of two signals. So that's, I think, what's different from all of this work here, which has been in the one-way setting with perfect feedback. So the question to me is whether any of these tools could be useful for the binary multiplier channel. And that's something that if you, if you think it is useful, I would love to team up with you to try to understand why and whether it could be used. Because I, I do have the knowledge in the BMC, but I don't have the knowledge of these particular tools. OK. The other connection that I've read up a little bit more on myself is this connection with theoretical computer science and with communi communication complexity. So I don't know if this is a notion that everyone is aware of, so I'll just talk about the basics. So in communication complexity, we have two parties, Alice and Bob. And Alice has access to some random variable x and Bob to some y, and they can be correlated, which is quite nice. So the goal here is to transmit bits one at a time to devise some protocol. They send, so this is noiseless, okay? So this is noiseless feedback, noiseless communication. One bit at a time or multiple bits at a time, it, it, they can be two in that direction, one like that, whatever. Whatever protocol you have of noiseless bits, so that you can compute some function, the same function on both sides with minimal number of bits. Okay, so that's the, the name of this game is minimal number of communicated bits to compute some function. And so this is interactive. This is truly interactive communication because it, it really does go back and forth. So they have this, you know, existing body of work that talks about um, this and it can be related to stuff we know in information theory, for example, uh, information theoretic compression to the entropy can be seen as the amortized um, number of bits per source symbol okay, to communicate at. So computer scientists don't often look at this limit n goes to infinity, or they don't necessarily look at that, like information theorists love to. right? They don't look at solving the same problem multiple times. They just want you to solve one instance and get the minimum number of bits for that one instance, right? or for the worst case instance perhaps not the average case instance, but there are connections there. The question is um, here, we for communication complexity, what is the amortized communication complexity? And this is work by Braverman that shows that uh, this becomes what is called the information complexity. So here, again, what we want is to compute some function f of x, y at both terminals using the minimum number of bits. Okay, and that's this cc f mu epsilon, this f is the function you want to compute. This mu is the distribution uh, of x and y. And this epsilon is the error with which you want to compute it. So the error tolerance. And so we they define this notion, this cc f mu epsilon, as the minimum communication complexity to compute this function to precision epsilon if your input distribution is mu. Right. And then they have, you can take some of these like mu to, to zero or max or min mu or whatever you want. And there's a whole bunch of notions here. And I see I'm running out of time. So I want to get to the, to the end to see why, why this is interesting. So there's a whole bunch of connections here with Weiner's if coding and some information theorists have actually looked at this problem as well. Um, 
but it's not exactly the binary multiplier channel, right? The binary multiplier channel is a little bit different. What I do want you to notice is that the a big result, and this is a recent result, well, by now it's 10 years old, but um, the intrinsic, the external information costs of computing the AND function. So let's say the function that you want is the AND of the two bits, right? So here they count the AND. This is log two of three bits. Okay, so just remember that, that number, right? So this is uh, the communication complexity of the AND function is log two, three bits. So if you want to send n copies of the AND function using a channel that is just plain channel, it is going to cost you n log three bits. It's not going to cost you two n bits. It's not going to cost you n bits. It's going to cost you n log three bits to send n copies of or to compute the and of two bit strings of length n. Okay, so you have a bit string of length n, bit string of length n. How many bits do you need to communicate in order to get? Oh, oh. This is x n? This is y n? Here I want x n and y n x n and y n. The number of bits you need is n log three. I think this is highly related to the binary multiplier channel. So why do I think that? So the here we have, on the left-hand side, we have the binary multiplier channel. So here we have the channel doing the and. Channel does and, right? And what I want to extract is the individual messages. Here, we have perfect channel, one-way channels, but you want to create the and, right? Create the and. You want to create some function or recreate some function. I see this, there's some duality going on here, but I can't quite figure it out. What is the exact duality? One wants to maximize or minimize the number of transmissions you need to calculate something. They both want to essentially minimize the number of bits you need to calculate something. Right. And so my conjecture is that the capacity, the equal rate capacity of the two way binary multiplier channel is one over log three. I think this is a beautiful number and that it cannot possibly be a coincidence that this number lies between the inner and outer bound and that there are so many other seemingly connected things in communication complexity that have the same result this log two three. So that's really what I wanted to end my talk is that this is my conjecture. I've worked on this with a student for a year or two now, <laughs> embarrassed to say that, but I haven't gotten anywhere. And I want to open this up to the community to see who can, you know, who can solve this. I am almost convinced that this must be it, but um, we need to get, we need to solve it. <laughs> and I think that's my whole talk is that we're looking for help improving this. And I think it's an interesting problem. Okay, that's it for me. Natasha, thanks. Um, any sure. questions from the audience? Um, I'll, I'll well, thanks for listening to me on a Thursday night. <laughs> Natasha, I am. Um... I don't know exactly about the capacity, but I can definitely say with certainty that the real-time problem, that is, suppose you want to transmit information through this channel um, and you, have, uh, you want to um, design, let's say, the optimal encoders uh, per our discussion earlier, can exactly be formulated uh, using a technique called the common information approach. Okay. Um, so you can formulate it, you can write an equation, it's going to be very ugly to optimize it, but that might be a starting point. And also what, 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 what is uh, coming out of this um, ingenious idea of this rectangle is that it turns out that this encoding scheme... Hold on, I'll turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. Yeah, so this encoding, this encoding scheme, scheme uses the uses joint... The joint Distribution, distribution or posterior or belief of, of, of the two messages. Of, of the two messages. And, and essentially, it tries to shape this. Per per oh, sorry. Yeah, I can. So, can you hear me? 
Yeah, sorry, try again. I, I get to yeah, yeah. So I was saying that this technique, if you write down the equations, it turns out that the encoder uh, can, can summarize the entire history, let's say, of previous feedback to the posterior belief of the, uh, the, the two messages, the joint distribution of the two messages, W1 and W2, which is starts as a uniform on the rectangle, as you showed, and then it, you, you start cutting pieces of it because some parts become zero and so on, and essentially it becomes concentrated towards the, the one message that you have sent. So this encoding scheme by me Wisen is, I don't know how they came up with that, but it's, it's very consistent with the actual uh, optimal encoding scheme. So, so there's something there for sure. There's something. Okay, so this is the common information. information. It's called the common information approach, yep. um, and it is used to solve um, dynamic team problems in in stochastic control. Wow. Okay, this sounds mm -hmm. great. I guess the the thing is, if you're going for the sum rate, uh, I mean, basically, big, the two rates being equal, I guess that's a sum rate maximization problem, yep. right? So then that. Yep. And that's that would be the joint the team objective in some sense. You want to maximize the sum of the rates uh, that you can get. And that would be the, how you would formulate it right? in the context of what uh, Kilias is saying. Cool. This is great. This is exactly the kind of thing I was hoping for. <laughs> if you're interested, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'll check this out. So, what is the author? I mean, I I think I'd be able to find it like that. Oh, this is this has started with uh, one of our colleagues here. His uh, name is Dimos Teneketsis. Okay. Um, so his students also uh, Ashutos Nayar and Aditya Mahajan has con have continued oh. this uh, this type of work. Yeah, I know Aditya. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah. I will definitely look into, the, into that. Thank you so much for thing, coming. Yeah, a similar thing might be possible to find, would be useful to find any other point on your boundary because it's basically, uh, I'm assuming this is a convex thing. I, I don't know if that is known or not. But if it's, oh, it's convex, convex. Then, convex. Yeah, so then basically it's just maximizing some, um, some weighted some of the rates, right? That will give you an, a point on the boundary. And that, so basically if you set, if you choose your objective function to be that, and then that you apply the same approach, I think that can give you the points on the boundary as well. Yeah, I'm just worried about whether this is computable, right? It may or may not be. The, the, yeah. the, the, the problem with the approach is it's very, I mean, the, it, there's huge complexity, but I think um, it's possible that there are ways they have in that methodology to try to simplify it. Um, yeah, it could be because this is not like a complicated channel, right? That that yeah, it is so simple it enough to have simplification. Simplify things, but yeah. yeah, yeah, a little bit harder. But nevertheless, if you want to trace that uh, boundary point, you would try any convex. I mean, basically any uh, linear combination of the rates, and that would be that would give you your objective function to. It that would be the team objective function that you go for to solve for the um, the point on the boundary. Cool. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions by anyone? If not, let's thank uh, Natasha. Bye, Thanks Natasha. so much for coming. Right, Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm truly honored. All right. no, thank, thank you. Great talk. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.